Man, everybody's good. Thanks for asking. Everybody's good. Um, it's just, you know, me and Dara, um, but back home in, in Tennessee, my folks are doing okay. So I'm, I'm happy for that. I'm happy for that. How about on your end, man? Everything, everybody okay? Yeah, everybody's still alive, doing their thing, hooking and crooking or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> They're here, man, you know. I hear you. And they, they didn't get us a long time ago, so I guess whatever DNA, knock on wood, is uh, still in play, brother, you know. Absolutely, man, <laughs> absolutely. Man, you have been like super um, prolific Oh, in, in in this quarantine, man, um, and and it's hard for for a lot of folks because there's that kind of spirit of of um, hesitation. You know, mm -hmm. we don't know when things are going to open back up. Uh, we don't know mm -hmm. when the new normal is really going to, to to kick off. But man, tell me some ways that you've been able to keep motivated and and stay um, busy and progressive. Um, just tell me about some of your initiatives, man, what you've been doing. Um, well, first and foremost, I, I have really, un I understand now what this music thing means to me, man. And I figured out it has nothing to do with playing on a stage. It took me about a few months in wow. the beginning of this shared experience to realize that I had to get back to uh, the why. You know, okay. like really reinforce that. And uh, the why for me is uh, is expression. You know, like we just talked about complaining or whatnot and letting it out. Well, originally, man, I, I didn't talk this much when I was younger. I talk more now than ever in my life. And um, playing the saxophone was a way of expressing myself. You know, so that was my original purpose. And I think I've gotten back in touch with that. And I'm very appreciative of that. It's made me appreciative of the fact that uh, we have this vehicle to talk, whereas, and, and say things maybe that's not, well, that's definitely not understood when you have notes, but the intent behind it, um, the why behind it is important. And I, I got back in touch with that. I had to do that. If I didn't do that, I would have really went bonkers, you know. <laughs> you know so that's sure. number one. Sure. You know? mm -hmm. uh, number two is uh, again fellowship with our with our brothers and sisters, however they want to be called, they, he, she, mm -hmm. and all of the above. Uh, I've really gotten a chance to uh, really get to know some old friends in another kind of way because mm -hmm. we all weren't gigging, so you know you you couldn't front and be like, yeah, man, I'm. I'm going off to Europe for six months or I, I'm doing this right. Nobody could front. It was just right. like, yo, we all got this, this thing in common. So mm -hmm. I got a chance to really uh, learn who my friends and who my tribe, what the tribe is. And it's a, it's a very small tribe. I know a lot of people, but there's a few people, you, yourself included, that I find myself being honest and I feel comfortable to reveal who I am, you know, because I got the high cheekbones. So a lot of people think, oh, this brother's just mad, but I'm not always mad. You know, there, there's a method to the madness. And I, and, I, and I find myself smiling more because we had to learn how to smile with our eyes because of this mask situation. Yeah, yeah. So that included, that meant that uh, there was an opportunity to reach out to a lot of people all over the world and um, first acknowledge this shared experience of not working and watching the uh, the venues unfortunately unfortunately close and some in some countries like uh, the UK we, we we're watching Brexit take its effect on just performing music, creative musicianship mm -hmm. and so that that was the gateway into uh, making new friends you know and I, I have to say man i've made a lot of new friends and a lot of new alliances and i have newfound respect for people that i i had, had admired from afar but uh the bright side if there is a bright side of the situation uh of covid has a, a allowed for people to kind of let their guards down and for me included to let my guard down and say hey you know, like Marvin Gaye saying, and what's going on? What's, what's happening, brother? What's happening, <laughs> sister? <laughs> sure. So that's beautiful, yeah. you know, and I think it's allowed us to build a uh, an infrastructure of uh, 
and an alliance of friendship and an agree and, and a lot of agreements as to what we're going to do going forward because now we can say pre-COVID it was one situation and I was uh, and, and I have to always say that you know that after COVID would be another situation and if history serves correct if we don't come together and say we're going to work together. Uh, irregardless of styles and old or new or ageism or uh, whatever, you know, people want to say, well, this is hot, this isn't, or this guy is post, that doesn't matter to a lot of us anymore. What matters now is the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and that includes people who don't look like us because it's a part of their culture also. So though, though there are inroads to our brothers and sisters on one and three too. So the culture is first, the love of the craft, and uh, going forward, I, I, I can say honestly, there's definitely about 30 to 40 people that's like, yo, we, in, we, we are one. So uh, keeping that thing together is uh, almost as important as uh, learning my skills correctly at this point. And I, I have a new passion in life, man, you know, so I'm, I'm happy for the fourth or fifth win that uh, this crazy situation has given me. So uh, that, that's, that's where I'm at at the moment, you know. I love it, man. I love it. I love it. Man, you touched well, we on it. We have no choice, right? I mean, well, that's, that's usually exactly. when, you know, if you got a bag of potatoes, if all you got is a bag of potatoes in your refrigerator, you know, you got to learn how to dice up potatoes in 101 different ways, that's right. you know, to not get bored. That's, you know? that's so right, man. That's Absolutely. been my dog star, bro. You know, oh, practicing bro. the horn. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you know, with the family side, um, mm -hmm just being appreciative of, of hearing you speak and talking to you and, mm -hmm. and talking to family and, right. and checking in on people, man. So uh, love has managed to uh, shine through despite the darkness all around us. You know, that's, how I, that's how I choose to view it. I love that. I love that. I, I find kinship in that, man. Uh, oh, man. And, and our, our conversations have been epic. I, I yeah, cherish them. It's very deep. <laughs> um, yeah, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man, I never asked you this, but I want to know, man. Like, I've only been to Detroit a couple of times. Okay. And and I have like this amazing conception of just a strong, resilient place with artistic uh people. What yeah. was it like for you and, and what characteristic of the city, if you could boil it down to one or two things that are a bedrock of your own personality? That are what city? I didn't catch the last part of it. What, what, what characteristic of Detroit would you say is, is a bedrock or a cornerstone of your own personality? Mm. I gotta say, man, um, there were two lenses going in my personal life, mm -hmm. two lenses that I viewed my people from. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not, and both, I understand it. One way was not the way that you want to say, okay, I'm going to be this when I grow up. Because nobody wants to be a chair when they grow up or, or a, a menace to society. Mm -hmm. that's one that that's over where should i put that on the right or left? i'll put that on the right okay because i'm a left thinking but I'm a, i try to be a progressive left, i love it you okay. know yeah. so on the right i had this i saw this uh -huh. and on the left was uh more of a uh looking at life through the lens of uh chrysler mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so you had two different polarities at least in my world going on you had the person that was like very and, and and I'm speaking about I'll speak about the male influence first. Okay. Uh, what I saw, you had the person in in my life that was very knowledgeable about a lot of things. Read book, read read a book, a, a new book once a week, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, had a, a, a upbringing that kind of drove him into into the right where I'm gonna take mines no matter what. And the fact that I'm doing this is a radical departure from accepting what they saw coming up. So that's ah, one thing, you know. Okay. And then you have my, that was my dad, mm -hmm. you know. And then you have my grandfather who was who worked in Chrysler. Uh, he was a part of the great mar migration, uh, came to Detroit from uh, Sunflower County, Mississippi. Yeah. And he, uh, he was a person that worked with his hands, had a sixth grade education. 
Mm -hmm. But uh, he managed, you know, he became a 33rd degree Mason, the invisible college. So he was learning all this stuff. Sure. And after he retired from Chrysler, he got involved in the politics of Detroit. So mm -hmm. I would see like, you know, there were stories of mayor. Uh, there was a popular mayor in Detroit called Coleman Young. He would wow. come by the house and, you know, I, I ended up moving with my grandparents when I was 12. So I would see like all of these uh, political figures, John Conyers and stuff coming to my yeah. crib. Yeah. To talk to my grandfather. Yeah. If you heard my grand my grandfather speak, and this is how ignorant I was, why well, I didn't know. Yeah, it is, it is ignorance is not knowing. You know, he had this real southern accent, and sometimes it was hard, sometimes it was very hard to understand what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, I used to be like, oh, you know, why are these big people come to my, my pops? I called him pops, and asking him for advice on political things, you know. So I saw a man. And I gravitated more towards the left because what he made me do, he, I, I was, I would say the word blessed that he he took me under his wing to watch him. Yeah. You know, to, to help me out, not for not going to the to the right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, I saw that. Well, the, the common thread between the two was my dad taught me. He said, "Look, mm -hmm. he didn't teach me much, man, but he said if you know how to, if you can read, you can do anything." Mm. That was his philosophy. He said, you know, the, the fact that you're reading, you can inform yourself. So they both had that shared thing, but I saw my grandfather put it towards a positive situation, you know, with a sixth grade education, but yeah. he had this brilliant mind. And when I was in high school, I got in trouble. And uh, this is important to me. This, this, this wow. changed my life. He went up to the high school and talked to the principal. And when, the, when he was done with the meeting, the principal came out and said, okay, so your grandfather is gonna give a speech to the high school. And I got, I was like, oh, damn, you know, nobody wants to be a country bunkin' in Detroit. I was like, and I loved him, but I was just like, you know, you when you're a teenager, you, your parents, or you, you be like, you don't want everybody to see what's up. I said, they gonna mm -hmm. laugh at him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my grandfather put his teeth in. And he he spoke in front of like four or five hundred kids. I was sitting there like, oh man, <laughs> and man, what came out of his mouth? Uh huh. It, it changed my life, man. So never judge wow. a book by its cover, and that's been yeah. my ethos in terms of like, you know, and, and 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 my take on it is never let people find you the way they found you. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 me coming up in that, you know. So mm -hmm. I, I I I challenge with the I, I'm always battling with, you know, I'm at the get it side no matter what versus yeah. let me be a diplomat, and and I, I think I try to play like that, you know, like and, and the only way I can link that mm -hmm. up with how that inspired me was, um, a good friend of ours, Eric Rivas, he said something. He said, you know, there's two lines in this music business. There's the long line mm -hmm. and the short line. Mm -hmm. Everybody is in the long line. You want to go towards the popular or whatever, but not a lot of people are in the short line. But that's the line that that matters. And when you leave this world, that's that's where your legacy is. Does that make sense? Yeah. What I'm saying? Absolutely, or, or absolutely, okay. man. That's great. That's, that's me in a nutshell. You know, these two different it. worlds. You know, but they were both good at it. Like my, uh -huh. my father, what he did. You know, he was he was uh you know, you know, if it was a third world world country. And if he was a revolutionary, he'd be, they'd probably make a statue for him. But, you know, we're in America and you can't do things like that. I hear you. <laughs> you <can't get> away, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I hear you, man. But I, I respect you. him. I, I've grown yeah. to respect his take on it. I just I just can't yeah. take that route because I don't want nobody telling me what time I, I got to go to bed and what time I got to get up, if you know what I mean. I you understand. <laughs> I understand, man. I understand. But that's I picked music instead of the gun, you know. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. I think the world should be appreciative of that. Yeah. Hey, hey man, I hear you. I hear you, man. But hey. that's that's just a that's a beautiful uh take and a beautiful uh if I can say uh ferociousness. There's an intensity <laughs> in your music that hit me when I first heard you. Oh. That's what I connected to. Thank and you. it's awesome to know the the backstory of of, of a lot of that, man. Um, but I, I have to say because of my, <laughs> my aunt, sister, mm -hmm. aunt, sister, mother, Monica Ross is uh, if I don't give it up to them because yeah, you know I had these two male different figures in my life, mm -hmm. but I have a lot of women in my mm -hmm. I grew up and and, and um, mm -hmm. like a lot of like a lot of people, you know, um, 
they raised me. I mean, they, they pushed me towards like, yeah, you can do this music thing. I believe in you, even if the world doesn't. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that is great. And sometimes that, that's bad because you need somebody to tell you when you're screwing up. And fortunately in my life, I have a, a, a beautiful aunt who's been a mother figure, a sister figure yeah. to me, who introduced yeah. me to uh, jazz and improvising. So, oh, that's you know, awesome. Yeah, you, I got these two polarities, but in between, man, is, are these amazing black women that just, yeah. hey, they, I wouldn't be here if it, if it wasn't for their, their grace and just love and yeah. strength. You know, mm-hmm. so it, yeah, I, it, it takes a lot of people to make us right. <laughs> that's the truth. That's the truth, man. That's yeah. the truth. Yeah, that's 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 incredible, man. Like, um, it's it's interesting. You you said just that she introduced you to the music. Mm-hmm. Did you did you have a moment when you decided in yourself, hey, man, I'm gonna give this thing a go as a career. I think I have what it takes, or I can get with people who can give me. Hmm. what it what it takes did you have kind of an aha moment did the light bulb come on or was it a progression well it was definitely a progression I have to say um I think people believed it more than me now Mm -hmm. looking back I Mm -hmm. have to give credit obviously I gave credit to my um my aunt um, my mom played a big role in it because she was a singer and we used to sing but I couldn't sing I mean I wouldn't I sing in the bathroom and at home, but I don't go yeah. out singing. But, mm-hmm. you know, so it, it was, I was always in the Motown is there, you know, so it was always some music and everybody could sing. Yeah. I mean, I used to, I remember growing up, man, seeing cats outside. I caught a little bit of those cats standing outside harmonizing okay. and, okay. and falsetto. I, I caught a little bit of okay. that. So it was, it was everywhere. Everybody, for some damn reason, could sing in Detroit. I don't know what the hell was going on, but I saw that. Uh-huh. But I, I did it because that's all I could do, you know, I, as far as I, I knew. I mean, I wanted to be a boxer at one time. I said, yeah, I could definitely hit hit some cats, you know, mm-hmm. but I'm fortunate mm-hmm. enough that, that changed. Mm-hmm. But the aha moment was, uh, it was two. Okay. Uh, James Carter took me to see my first, very first jazz performance. Okay. Um, I went to see Sun Ra and his orchestra came to Detroit. Yo, wow. Yeah. yeah. Was Sun Ra still to, alive at no, the time? Sun- yeah, he was alive. I met okay. him. <laughs> wow. I was about, I was about uh stop stop there. Stop there. Yeah, you met, I met Sun him Rock. twice. <laughs> how oh, tell you gotta tell you gotta unpack that man. Oh, I gotta man. know about that. How, well, how was he? Oh man, well, when I met him, he had these like elf shoes on there. Yeah. And you know, everybody knew James Carter. He's he's been famous forever. Mm-hmm. So he said, mm-hmm. Man, you know, I'm I'm you know, I, I we I went to the same high school he went, and unfortunately uh, enough, uh, at that time, I think our high school, Northwestern in Detroit, had the best jazz band in the country at that point, you mm-hmm. know, late 80s. So a lot of the uh alumni would come up mm-hmm. out of pride to help out with the band. At that time, right. it was a the band teacher was a great band teacher by the name of Ernie Ernest Rogers. So mm-hmm. I was the, the tenor player that was going to replace James Carter. So James took, wow. me, took me under James wow. Carter and Alex Harding, a great baritone saxophonist. Yeah. They took me under their wing. And um, a big component of, of that uh, hang was listening. So he's like, yo, man, uh, Sunrise coming to town. I'm taking you down to see Sunrise. So that was my first wow. real wow. jazz performance. Wow. And I saw John Gilmore. And this blew my mind. <laughs> Yeah, he man, he and he was a beautiful cat, man. And like he played, they played body and soul. They played the tune. Mr. Gilmore did his thing, and then the band stopped. And John Gilmore played the entire history of the tenor saxophone. Mm. He did it in the style of Coleman Hawkins, Don mm. Bias. You know, obviously, you know the thing with him and John Coltrane is is a debate that who got from who. He mm-hmm. went there, and then he took it to. Out, out in the stratosphere. So I was like, yo, you know, and then brought it back. And then after, after, after all that, man, you know, Mr. Sunrai was like, they started, he got up, started doing his thing. They had to dance with the violin. And then they went to Let's Go Fly a Kite. And I'm about to cuss, <laughs> I'm sorry, man. That shit was so, it blew my mind, man. Yeah, and man. Went backstage. And I didn't, at that time around 14 or 15, I didn't realize the significance and like, the uh, I'm I'm so fortunate to have shook his hand and talked to him, man. And some wow. and James Carter introduced wow. me to 
to John Gilmore. And he was so cool, man. He was like, hey, young man, don't ever, ever, ever stop, no matter what. He, he kept saying, he said, don't stop. He said, it's, it's more than a nose. It's, it's something else. So that that was, after seeing that, that was a big impression. And then I met Sunra. And so I walked up to this, I said, this is a pleasure to, he said, yeah, I, my name, I'm Sunra and I'm, I'm from Saturn. And I really believed it. I was like, yo, this cat is, is from something else. You know, yeah. and then when I started reading about him and, and getting the, uh, you know, realizing his historical importance in mm -hmm. the music, mm -hmm. you know, he was writing for Fletcher Henderson and he had yep. like this, the That's whole right. the whole self improvement and, and and taking care of you know he had a record company he had this yeah. you know mm -hmm. and I was like yo I met somebody really important so that was one aha moment and mm -hmm. then that same year Mr Sonny Rollins came yo That's great and I saw that and I I went by myself with that when I skipped school to catch the day show mm. um, and I saw Mr Rollins playing I was blown I said man it was just for me, and now, now I can put it into words, man. It felt like Detroit. He had the, and it doesn't mean it was not a, a high art. It was just, it was a blue collar sensibility about it that appealed to everyone that was there and myself. You felt like he was, he was about the people, man. That, that's what I got. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm older, I know what it was. And mm -hmm. then I called him at night. And when I saw the night show, man, he just, it was even more. And mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? I want to do this for the rest of my, this is what I want to do. Wow. I didn't wow. think I had it. Wow. It wasn't at that point, it was not about do I have what it takes? This was like, this is what I want to do. So whatever mm -hmm. that takes, I'm gonna do it. I mm -hmm. damn sure didn't have it. I mean, it was no, I don't think mm -hmm. there's any indication of uh, hey, this guy's gonna get better. I was just that kid that hung around. I was very respectful of my elders. I, I'm sure of that, you know, that's how I was raised. And yeah. I think they were cool with the fact that I was, you know, I wasn't a, I was a knucklehead, but I wasn't a knucklehead around them. Cause back then, them cats would tell you like, yo, sit your ass. <laughs> it wasn't you know it. politically you know correct. It. it was like, you know say it, say it, man. For all intents and purposes, yeah. if you was in a room with them, they were your dad and you respected that. And I mm -hmm. still, I call them Mr. Such and Such. I don't, I don't sure. go outside of that. Sure. Cause it's a sign of reverence and mm -hmm. respect. So. When I called Mr. Sonny Rollins, I was like, yeah, man, this, this is what I want to do. You know, because yeah. I think when I was, I know when I was nine, mm -hmm. uh, I saw uh, the G-Man documentary that yeah. when it just came out. Yeah. And then I was like, that was my first inkling of like, okay, yeah, this is, it was really interesting. And that got mm -hmm. me to like take up music and, and, wow. and you know, in, in elementary school. Yeah, man, that's. So, yeah, that was my aha moment watching yeah. Mr. Rollins like. Yeah. This, tear the house down man i was like wow absolutely absolutely it 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 all makes sense now i mean i hear <laughs> i hear him in your playing and oh, and and you. in your bands you know playing you know without the piano mm -hmm. you know something that he pioneered Definitely. you say yeah man jd is in the lineage of that but again in your attack and approach it makes sense that sonny rollins was a like a a, a pivotal crucial early influence and you got oh, to yeah, see him, yeah. you know, you really hear that attack and, and intensity again, intensity in your sound, the same, the same kind of thing that he had. Well, I mean, well, I, I you know, yeah, I mean, of course I went through, I mean, and, and I still, I mean, I don't think you should ever give up the Titans, you know, you, mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. I think it's important to uh, keep in touch with that. It keeps mm -hmm. you in check. It doesn't let your head get big. It doesn't, yeah. you know, and I, th I know it's cool to say, you hear a lot of times like, well, you know, you sound like, you sound like, but I'm okay with that. I'll, I'll, I'll wear my influences on my sleeve because I think it gives players depth and it, and it gives you roots. So mm -hmm. thank you for saying that. I mean, I, I, hey, yeah, he's in there. Wayne Shorter, Mr. Wayne Shorter, John Coltrane. Oh, you know, I try to just, you know, because I heard a saying that Mr. Wayne Shorter said that, you know, how do you come up with something new? You take two old things and you put them together. Mm -hmm. you know, so it makes mm -hmm. sense to me. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You know, someone else that 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 I hear uh, in you that doesn't get talked about, two people, actually, um, Gene Ammons. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And, yeah. and then, too, with all of the proliferation of players that, and I absolutely should be influenced by Wayne Shorter and John Coltrane. 
but I hear Dexter Gordon oh, also, yeah. man. Just, yeah. just like you're, you're, you're helping to um, refocus people on that big tenor sound. That's the best way I can say it. Like it's okay. there's, there's a lot of um, uh, you know acrobatics in players that I hear now, which is great. But mm -hmm. I think sometimes uh, the tone, the actual sound of the instrument, can mm -hmm. kind of be uh, monochromatic if people don't do their research. But yeah, I feel true. like I hear that that Gene Ammons and, and Dexter Gordon like influence in in your oh, yeah you you you're right. I mean that's what, and I can almost say that about because in my opinion Detroit is a tenor saxophone town, man. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's about mm -hmm. 10 cats that you haven't heard about yet, okay. but you will. And we're all, we were all, we're all coming from the tradition of, uh, yeah, you gotta have a tone, man. They, they, like, that's the first thing it's like, if you, and they say, if you don't have a sound and everything else, and you got, and you can kind of equate that with speaking, you know, mm -hmm. you, you listen to a, 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 an orator speak, yeah. you know, if the voice is, isn't commanding, a lot of times the words go go by the wayside. So yeah, yeah. tone is important. So that yeah. that was impressed upon. That's impressed upon most tenor players coming out of Detroit, even to this day. Yeah. Sound that's, is number one. Yeah. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Yeah. Man, I, I tell you another time you shook me up. It was about maybe four years ago. Uh, you had a run of albums with um, Graffiti and Americana. Mm -hmm. and, and in those two projects, man, like, there was this overt focus on the blues. And I'm not talking about necessarily a 12 bar form, mm -hmm. but man, what really connected me further to your style and your conception, you know, I would, I would lay awake at night just listening to like oh. John Lee Hooker, you know, just for, yeah. I just had just about a year where that's what yeah. I would go to bed to just John Lee Hooker. That would just yeah. fall asleep to that. And man, it just made me hungrier towards that, um, acoustic kind of blues thing that yeah. a lot of well african-american people don't always hold up in the esteem um it's it's part of our our, our, our fabric our being but we aren't always explicit about like saying that that's an influence or showing that you know we're down with you know the muddy waters and the howling yeah. wolves and, and that kind of thing um True. man you got a tune that i think is a bona fide hit lightning for lightning hopkins i'm like man <laughs> oh, don't you stop hopkins. playing that song man that's that's a hit dude Woo! that, that Thanks, man. I, i've only played it live a few times man actually i'm, I'm gonna get back, back and play it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's my song lightning man, hopkins, man. Yeah, oh yeah. man it's but, funny you brought this up because I, I had this conversation with my my uh my son elijah he's about 15 now he plays mm -hmm. trumpet mm -hmm. and something told me to like i'm I said, look, man, you know, I don't know if we ever really rap because he's getting older now and mm -hmm. he's taking lessons and, and getting into classical trumpet. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's finding his way through the music, whether he plays it for a life as his life or just as, you know, rewiring and bettering himself. Uh -huh. I said, man, you know, and then, you know, you, you have all this type of things going on with the music now, just with the uh, popular music. Mm -hmm. said, this is what you got to keep in mind. I said, there's, I said there, there are six things, at least what I, I think, and anyone else can add on to it, but it's like, you have the field hollers, uh, mm -hmm. cotton field, slaves were singing that. That's one, you have gospel, the black spirituals, then you have uh, the blues, then you have jazz, rock and roll, and then hip hop. And I said, man, your job is, you almost have to be an ethnomusicologist, man. You have to find for yourself the link between all of that. Mm. And I said, never let anybody tell you or play down that, that link because that's a source of pride. Like, and I, and I tried to impress upon him that um, for a lot of years, those were the only times where we could really speak and, and, and there are hidden meanings in those songs. Yeah. Today is different. Um, it's, it's kind of, a, and not to knock anybody's thing, but it's kind of been perverted. There's a perversion of, of, the, of the Black black American music. Mm -hmm. Whereas it was more, it, it's at times, a lot of times it was a source of inspiration or yeah. experience, but now it seems to be something. That, I'm not saying I, I got anything against partying. And right. I said, well, and when I said, look, just if you want to check out who you checking out now, 
I said, that's that's nothing new. I said, and then I put on for him uh, Jelly Roll Morton's Murder Blues. Oh, yo. <laughs> he was like, what? I said, man, ain't nothing new under the sun. I ain't saying don't have a good time and like talk about partying. Yeah. But you want to be an informed listener. You want to know because because music is powerful. And if you don't know what you're listening to, and if you don't have the, like my aunt would say, the spirit of discernment, mm -hmm. you find yourself being caught up in your head and not knowing why. You know, so yeah, the blues is important. I mean, in my opinion, I try to, everything that I play, play I try, it is the blues in a sense, you know. And the Americana album was an investigation for me as to what is the blues. Mm -hmm. it certainly isn't 12 bars. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's something else. And I'm not trying to get all spiritual and spiritual. No, man, go there. Go but there. I'm trying to be spiritful. You know, that's the quest. Spiritful, mm -hmm. you know, full of spirit. And that was my investigation into um, different forms. And at, at that point in time, like, I really sat down and said, let me check out uh, the blues situation and then I, I learned man there's a language in that yeah. you know there's, there's a historical yeah. significance and then it, it helped it helped me link up with things before the blues like I was able to listen to uh gospel music in a different way which led me to the field hollers which, which led me to listen to cantor music in a different way mm. or food in a different way then I realized that wait a minute you know the blues is something we all share in this world we just have this is the way we do it that spirit of it Mm -hmm. Period. You know, so then I, I realized that um man, you could play anything, it could be no changes or, or 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 a lullaby, but if your intent is something, you know, then that 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 is the blues for me. And I told him, I said, you know, intent plus knowledge is what you want to strive for. Because the mm. first thing people, I think, in my opinion, the first thing people hear is your intent. You know, your intent comes first and that's your sound. So I, you got to put these, you have to put all of these things into that sound and then the notes, that's that's second, you know? Yeah. So that was our conversation. So yeah, you know, I'm, I, he's checking out the blues and I'm like, you know, it's not all bad or anything, but it's a story in the form of the story. That's what you want to get down in your solo. You know, yeah. that's, that's the quest. That's how I think about it, you know? Man, I love and, it. And that means you got to check out his history. You have to know why, mm -hmm. the why behind it. And you almost, have, like I said, you almost have to be an ethnomusicologist because everything, in my opinion, is symbolism, you know, and you want to represent something when you play, whether it's fun yeah. or serious, you know, but you want to be, you want to be a Jedi, you know, it's kind of like a jazz musician is a Jedi or a grid, you know, like my, our friend Jeremy Pills book, it's a grid mm -hmm. telling these stories because they edify people and, and, and make them, they, you can make people do things with music, man. Music is deep, you know? Yes, it is. Once you learn that, man, it's, you have, then you gotta get to a point where it's like, okay, can I just listen to this and just enjoy it? That's where I'm at now. Just trying to enjoy it and not take it apart. But where he's at, I need him to study it because it makes you a better person. You know? mm -hmm. Makes you a worldly person. You can go into many different situations and relate to people. You know? mm -hmm. So that's that's the goal, you know. Yeah, yeah. He'll get it. Yeah, he's a bad dude. He'll get it. That's cool, man. Yeah. That's really cool. That's cool, man. This new record uh, that you're about to release uh, mm -hmm. this summer, um, you're 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 stepping out and doing something that not too many people have done. Um, I I know Sonny Rollins has a solo saxophone album. Mm -hmm. Um, I've oh, heard, cool. yeah. The, yeah um, Dave Liebman has has one from the early two thousands, I think. Um, but honestly, I haven't heard too many full on albums solo saxophone, man. And thank you for 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 letting me preview this, man. Oh yeah, man. I, no, I, no, I was brother. I was knocked <laughs> out. I was knocked out by it, man. I, I'm just kind of like, wow, he's got the 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 not only the guts. <laughs> but the story to be able to put into these they're kind of like mini stories to me like yeah. mini vignettes you know kind exactly of. but yeah. but but you know for what led you to do it and 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 kind of what is um the is there a message that you hope conveys in this in this work definitely um i have to give what kind of gave me the inkling to try it mm -hmm. 
uh, I checked out uh, Bradford Marsalis's uh, solo album called Solitude. Okay. And um, I I listened to solo saxophone a little bit, but I had not I, I didn't check it as much as I did as of late. Um, what I what I liked about his recording was the fact that he um, there was an architecture towards it, but it was a it, it seemed to be a clear architect mm-hmm. and architecture, so you could mm-hmm. follow it. You know, it wasn't whereas Mr. Rollins' solo scope, in my opinion, I can't you know I'm, I'm not him and I don't know what he was thinking, but what I got for from it from that performance was you're what you're hearing the process. You hear yeah. him search, yeah. uh-huh. you know, and he was brave enough to reveal that. Mm-hmm. That album, I, I, I've always checked that album out because I, I, I've always found that album as a source of uh, trying to uh, to understand his process. So I, that was always in my catalog, like as I go back to every few months and just check it out. Okay. And it was always different. Mm-hmm. But then I got hip to, and I, I, I had of course known who he was, but I had I had not. I didn't really sit down and check him out, but I, I have, as of late, with Steve Lacey, another mm-hmm. type of architecture to his thing. Mm-hmm. So, um, so I, I was checking out everybody's solo solo uh, album because I was trying to learn how to play solo saxophone. Because yeah. quite honestly, yeah. when COVID nineteen went down, <laughs> I was so afraid. I was like, wait a minute, we. I, I just said, man, we can't play with people. What the mm-hmm. hell am I going to do? You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's too late to. Mm-hmm. I mean, I could be a lawyer or something, but it's too late. <laughs> I mean, it, I was scared, man. Like everybody sure. else, I was like, sure. wait a minute. So, my place of business, our places of businesses are closed. Right and now, we're doing this computer thing. You know, I ain't really a tech cat. You know, so I was like, I called up the record company. I was like, I said, man, I'm gonna learn how to play by myself, and they laughed at me, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They, no, they did, bro. Seriously. Oh man. I was like, man, I'm I'm gonna learn how to I'm gonna try to learn how to like do this by myself. I mean, I've done a couple solo gigs, but it was kind of like a knockoff. So I was like, all right, I, I tried it. Uh-huh. And some people listen. And of course, I've bust, you know, everybody's played outside at some point you by yourself. That's a different kind of thing. But yeah. I had never sat down and said, okay, this is my method or my mm-hmm. well, this is how I can approach it with my limited skills. Mm-hmm. So a few months went by and I, and I was proud. I got back into practicing and I was like, okay, I got to practice. And I was like, okay, well, how can I do this? And uh, I keep a notebook of uh, songs that don't make it onto albums. Okay. And then I realized, I was like, yo, wait a minute. These tunes were never meant to be with the band. They actually work. They're little ideas, but they actually okay. they weren't fleshed out. Mm-hmm. But I said, what if maybe I could approach it where I'm trying to flesh it out in the studio? Like mm-hmm. without, like how I would work on it if I was going to present it to my band. Mm. And so months went by, and I, I called my record company. I said, "Man, you know this, this solo thing. I'm 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 going to make a recording of it and just give you an idea of um, what I what I what I, how I'm going to approach it." And then I guess they took me seriously. Then it was like, "Fuck it, all right." We'll, we'll <laughs> They gave me the green light to do it. I love so it. So I'm in Cincinnati, man. They sent in all these mics and stuff. It was like, okay. And I gave it a shot. And for three days, man, uh-huh. I was in the studio for like six or seven hours. I probably got like over 100, 200 takes. Wow. And, wow. And like the first hour of the, the, the recording process, I was like, what the hell am I doing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because mm-hmm. I heard all of my flaws, man. And I was so used to... Um, Lat or or, or 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 linking up with someone behind me or trying to like have mm-hmm. this uh, connection with mm-hmm. band members and it was just me, so that was the first day. It was a disaster, and I was like, "Damn, you know they put this money into it and and I'm gonna fail and everybody gonna every, everybody's gonna know that I'm a fake." No, <laughs> no. Is up, you know. I was like, "You gonna hear all my flaws?" So the second day, I was like, "I had to cool down." I was like, "Okay, wait a minute." This is this was eye-opening for me. It was like uh the room is my band. Mm, mm, okay. Okay. And this light came out like and, and, and I kind of like peeped that with Bradford's album on, on Solitude. And I, I talked to him about it. I was like, you know, he was talking about how he worked the room. So I had to go into my memory banks of, of badass people who gave me tips. 
Mm-hmm. And like, okay, well, let me let me check out where I am. And when I did that, um, I got comfortable mm-hmm. and I, I had to accept. And for lack of a better phrase, I had to love myself, imperfections and all. I had to I had to accept myself wherever I was at at this moment. This is where I'm at, where I'm at. And again, it was not really about the notes. What it was really about, what I found out was me preparing for this album and and, and, and um, trying to amass material and listening and, and reading and questioning. Mm-hmm. Um, it kept me going through the first year of this madness, man. It gave me something to do every day, despite not having a gig, you know. So that was my dog star, man. It was like, okay, well, that's, this is what it's about. So it doesn't matter if people like it or not. I hope they do. But what it's about is, I'm a cuss again. I'm doing this shit no matter what. <laughs> so, you know, I'm doing this for JD because I got to do this. This is what I do. And, yeah. and quite frankly, this is the truth. This is where I'm at. And these songs are raw. And there probably be, won't be a situation like this again where I'm trying to like, work on some stuff in real time on a recording. Mm -hmm. So I got comfortable with that. And when I did that, man, the room felt like it was activated. And then Mm -hmm. I know this sounds spooky and whatnot, but it it felt like I had to like come to grips with where the performance space that I was in Uh and get used to that, which led me to uh, another thing where I realized that even in a trio situation, the room is is the fourth member because you activate that room when you play. The yeah. people activate it with you. So, you know, it's a part of the band. So when I did that, I, my heart rate slowed down and I was less scared. And I was like, okay, well, this is this is the experience in real time. And yeah, I'm revealing myself, but that's okay because I'm doing it for a purpose that I need to do it to survive. So hopefully this will be a flashlight for someone else that... uh it really ain't about the notes. It is about the notes, but it's really about your intent. And that was my intent. And I'm, I'm happy that someone allowed, well, not allowed me, but, you know, assisted me in recording this. Uh, am I scared what people are going to say? I, I'm, I'm thinking like they might tear it to shreds, but mm. it's okay. The purpose was for something else. And I heard all of my flaws and what I need to work on. And I'm, I'm just sharing it with the world, man. So yeah. it, it's an honest statement. Uh, you know, it's honest. Cause I have no gimmicks. I just got that damn saxophone <laughs> and my flaws. And it was like, hey, life give you lemons, bro. You know what to make. You know, that's that's my lemonade, bro. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it, man. Oh man. Well, man, it, it's it's been a pleasure. I'll get you to hang on here for just a second, man. Sure. But, but thanks for staying up with me, man. I, I really appreciate Yeah, brother. Yeah, man. You know, yeah. hey man, it's just uh we got to do what we got to do, man. But that's the story of our lives, right? You know, Absolutely. book of crook, bro. That's it. You know, survival. That's it. <laughs>